So my guest today is Christine Handy, mother, model, humanitarian, and cancer survivor. Also author of Walk With Me, a novel based on her experiences of multiple surgeries and cancer treatments, which is currently being made into a film called Willow. Today, Christine devotes her life and her energy to supporting, helping, and motivating others. Welcome, Christine Handy. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to be here. Wonderful to have you with me. So, Christine, you have um, gone through many changes in your life, and some of them not by choice. And you've had many challenges uh, with health, which started in your 30s, you know, with, with botched colon surgery, then which took a year to recover from. Take me to that time and the impact it had on you. You know, it's interesting. I've been thinking about that time recently. And a lot of people, when they interview me or talk about my story, they don't bring up that time. They really go to the cancer or they go to the arm, which are obviously major illnesses and traumas. But the colon is what really started all of this. And when I was 35 years old, I was a thriving mother, wife, model, and self-proclaimed athlete. And so when I had this emergency colon surgery, I was, you know, I had never been sick in my life, really. I mean, I had the common cold and I had flus and things like that, but I was not a sick person. And so during that time, during the surgery, the doctor nicked a vein in one of my bones in my pelvis. And he also knew that I was a model. And I was a lingerie model. I was a bathing suit model. I mean, I, scars were not an option for me in my career. I was very careful about not having scars. And so during the surgery, when he nicked a vein, he he fought really hard to stop the bleeding. But ultimately, he couldn't figure out the source of the blood. And so he had to open me up. But when he opened me up, and it it was an emergency situation where I was losing so much blood, so he cut me from hip to hip. And so when I woke up from that surgery, I was in truly grotesque pain. And I would, my blood pressure was so low because they had, I had lost so much blood. And when your blood pressure is that low, they can't give you pain medication. And so I had been cut from hip to hip. They had taken 28 inches out of my colon. I wake up from surgery. I have a port in my neck and I have a blood bag above my head. And I have no idea what's happened. And I'm in grotesque pain. So I ask the nurse who's sitting next to me, I said, well, I mean, I was shaking so badly because when you're in that kind of grotesque pain and you're not on pain medication, your body just shakes. And I was trying to stop my body from shaking because the more I shook, the more pain I felt in my abdomen where they had just cut me. And I had hundreds of staples and hundreds of st- stitches. And I, she said, she was very cursed. And she just said, I don't know. Your doctor will come in soon. And I said, I need some pain medication. This is, I can't stand the pain. And she goes, you have too low of a blood pressure. We can't give you any pain medication, but she was not kind. And in those moments of despair and and trauma, you need somebody that's kind to you. I'll never forget the way she treated me. I'll never forget her tone. And that was like the beginning for me of trying to, I had built a home right on dependency on external and my, and my value in society. That was my home. And I was, and I was secure in that. This was part of the unraveling where that home was starting to crumble. And I didn't recognize it at the time. But when I woke up with a port in my neck, I started to question like, wait a minute, people get sick. Like things happen that you don't, you can put yourself in a good position, but things happen that you have no idea will happen to you. It's like getting in a major car accident. You don't expect it, but it happens. And post that, at what point because clearly, physically, you were in a very bad way. Um, and, you know, this, this obviously had come out of nowhere because it was, it was a botched procedure. At what point did you recognize that you wanted to shift something in your life or that there had to be a shift partly enforced by this whole, but it could have, you could have gone in a different direction, right? So I think it was that time where I had to really slow down my life. So it took about a year for, for me to get over that surgery. And, and during that time, there was a lot of quiet time. 
but I busied myself. I tried to busy myself. Now it wasn't with modeling, of course, because I was recovering from this major surgery, but I still, my mindset was still fill the time, fill it with society, fill it with, you know, my, my idols, we all listen, we all idolize something, right? You have to figure out what you idolize. And for me, I was idolizing physical attributes. I was idolizing accolades from the world. I was idolizing materialism. It's super easy to look back and see that. But at the time, I didn't realize that. So it was that point in time in my life where I started to question, wait, how am I really living my life? And how do I want to continue to live my life? Because this was obviously a wake up call, but it wasn't enough of a wake up call for me. I needed another. So. Christine, during that year, you were rebuilding yourself and building a a new version of you, but not very much later, you headed into further surgery. Where were you in your head at that time? You know, I, I was, there was a shift inside of me, but I wasn't implementing it. I was still going back to that dependency, right? And so at 41, so now six years later, I have a torn ligament in my right wrist. You would think that was no big deal. For me, I just thought, okay, you go to, go to a surgeon, you repair it. I saw three different surgeons. I picked the one who went to Stanford, the Ivy League guy. Um, he came well re- recommended. And, you know, he, was, he, had a, he had a good personality. He was engaging. And he did the surgery. And six weeks after the surgery, they took the cast off. And two days after that, my arm ballooned. Like I woke up and the swelling was so, um, it was so massive. My, my arm looked like my thigh. And so, and the pain, you can imagine, swelling causes pain, right? You can imagine if your arm now looks like your thigh, the, the amount of swelling and the amount, it's, it's incredible and the amount of discomfort. And so for that whole day, I just held my arm on my chest like a baby I wouldn't, again, here we go back to the shaking. My body was shaking because the pain was so bad, but I was afraid to call the doctor because the world that I had lived in, that what I was taught as a young girl was you don't question authority. You don't bother people on the weekends. And so I, that was my mindset. So I waited until Monday to call the doctor. And when, even when I did call the doctor, I thought I was putting him out. I thought I was being a burden for him which is ridiculous, like looking back, but that's that I didn't have a very high self-esteem. It's funny because people think models all have a very high self-esteem. I think it's the opposite. I've worked as a model. Right. Because there's so much pressure on models. Well, and, and you, you're constantly being criticized for what you look like, but you're constantly being promoted for what you look like. So it's very confusing. And don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing the modeling industry. I'm still modeling. In fact, I'm, I'm walking in New York fashion week this spring. I love, I love, Oh, I love my career. I love modeling. It feels a little bit like home for me. Um, I've gone through a lot of different, uh, well, twists and turns in the modeling industry, but I, I, I do love it. So going back to the surgery on my arm. So I called the doctor on the Monday. I go in to see him. And again, because my self-esteem was built on sand, right? It was built on that outward dependence. It was shaky. And so if somebody criticized me or if somebody made me feel shame, which is what this doctor ultimately did, he basically told me that the pain and the swelling was in my head and that there was a misfire between my brain and my arm saying that there was trauma, but really there wasn't. So he put me on pain medication. He put me on an anti-nerve medication, and he sent me to his pain management doctor. She concurred with his diagnosis. So now I have two medical doctors that have said the same thing. It's called RSD. It's an, it's a, it's a misfire from your brain. And they sent me to a physical therapist far away from their office. So he had a physical therapist in his office. He didn't want me there. He pushed, he put me, but I, again, it's so easy to see this looking back, but at the time, Especially the truth is when you're in really intense pain, your brain shields you from any knowledge that it doesn't need. It just forgets. It's a coping mechanism, isn't it? And also I think it's to your point, we defer to those whom we believe have higher knowledge, 
right? Exactly. And we defer to, you know, as a child, you defer to your parents, you defer to your teachers, even though they aren't necessarily always omniscient, but it's part of the structure of life and keeping things safe. And when it comes to expertise, be it legal, medical, we defer often just exactly. against our own instincts, right? What what was the mental impact of you on on having that experience whilst, you know, you're, you're clearly unwell, you're, you, your arms ballooned, you're feeling dreadful? Um, the emotional impact was great. So it wasn't just the doctor that was not believing me. It was also people within my own home. And so, and so I had the people that were the closest to me saying, he's the best doctor in town. He, what he says goes. And I was questioning myself going, well, gosh, maybe I am making this up. Maybe it's me. And over the course of several months, the doctor accused me of being a hysterical housewife. That was his words, not mine. And I had never shed a tear in his office. So he was calling me a hysterical housewife when he had never seen me shed a tear or raise my voice. And he also not. So I sent him a picture one day because a piece of metal had been pushed out of the opening where they had done the surgery several months after the surgery. So now the, the, the openings were not closing. He kept cauterizing them. That's a clear sign of infection. But I'm not a doctor. I didn't go to medical school. So I was listening to him. So when I sent him this picture of this piece of metal that had come out of my arm, of course, the metal was now on the outside of my arm. He told me I made that picture up. And I was too ashamed to tell my husband or anybody that that piece of metal had come out of my arm. And I was too ashamed to tell him what he had said to me. Because at that point, I was starting to think that he was right, that I was now making this stuff up. When did you have an epiphany moment in relation to how you were being treated or not treated and how this was being handled? Well, this is actually a great question. And I've done hundreds of interviews. and I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. And, and it's a great story. So for several months now, this is, in, this is now six months into this deal. I'm going to physical therapy five days a week. And I'm forgetting things. Like I forgot to pick up my son one day. I don't know if if you're a parent, that's like one of the worst. That's one of the oh, most I know. same. That's the worst, isn't oh, it? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm, I was so, I was in so much pain. I was in so much discomfort. I had so many casts on my arm. And these casts were huge. They built these casts for me so I couldn't drive. So I had to have, I had to rely on people to get me to and from physical therapy. I had to rely on people to get my son. And I have two sons, but one of my sons was in boarding school. And so I'd forgotten to pick up my son one day. And I was walk, I was doing a lot of walking around the neighborhood. And one day, somebody that worked in the parks and recreation part of our community walked over to me when I was on my walk. And he said to me, oh, you got a new cast. Now, I have never seen this man in my life, although probably I had seen him. I didn't, know, I didn't recognize him. And I looked down at my arm and I thought, if somebody that works in my neighborhood notices that I've now on like number 12 cast, there's something wrong. There's something going on. And immediately I picked up the phone and I called a friend and said, you said you had an orthopedic doctor. Can you call him for me? I need a second opinion. And it took that incident for somebody outside of my life to recognize that, that I had been in all these casts for me to go, red flag, red flag, but I didn't see it for six months. So I did go see this second opinion. And within hours, I was in surgery because I had an infection in my arm and they dated it back to the date of surgery. So my arm was completely destroyed. Every single bone in my wrist was broken. I had no cartilage left. And they didn't even know when I went into surgery if I was going to keep my be able to keep my arm. How long did it take you to recalibrate from that horrific experience, given that you'd already gone through this massive emotional and physical and psychological challenge with your colon? It's like round two. What, what were the lows and the highs in that time? So it definitely was round two. So here's the clincher. <laughs> here's the, this is the, the part where it really gets messy. I, I went up to New York City to find a surgeon that would repair my arm. And the only reason, the only way to repair my arm was to fuse my wrist. And so I have no wrist. So now I've become handicapped. 
And they put cadaver bones in my arm. They put cadaver Achilles tendon. They put cadaver grass. Because, and they took out my bones. And so I'm in a cast in New York. No, I don't live in New York. I was in a cast in New York at a hotel. And I was up there for my six-week post-surgery checkup. So I have a cast on from my fingertips to my shoulder. And they don't want me to move my arm at all because those grafts will move. They have to stay in place so that forever my arm will be you know, uh, fused. So I'm in a hotel room and now for months I've been just pouring liquid soap over my shoulder and washing that off my body because I'm in a cast and so my arm's outside of the shower. So in this hotel, they don't have liquid soap. So I, ta- I struggle to take this bar of soap. This huge cast is out of the shower so it doesn't get wet. And I wash my left breast and I immediately find a lump. Within five days, I'm diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. So I didn't even have time to digest. Now, I'm a, I'm a mother. I have two young kids. I didn't even have to di- time to digest the fact that my arm is now fused. I'm now handicapped. And now I have breast cancer. How did you feel in that moment? Because, you know, it's almost inconceivable, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, How, that yeah. moment, I mean, that moment of one might call it crisis. What was the emotion at that point for you? I, I couldn't wait to die. Yeah. I couldn't wait to die. And how long did that last? That f- feeling Too of long. despair? Yeah. <laughs> Too long. Um, I did really, truly plot my suicide. Because now it wasn't just my, the fact that I have have going now on my third trauma. It wasn't just the fact that I couldn't figure out how to take care of my own children. It wasn't just the fact that I was trying to figure out how I was going to live the rest of my life with a fused arm. I had completely lost and now was about to lose my hair. And everything that I thought was value for me was my dependence on my what I look like. That was completely getting washed away. And I didn't know who I was. And so I didn't have anything to stand on. I didn't have a self-esteem to ground me. I didn't have any self-love or self-worth. That had already been gone. The bully doctor had ripped away every piece of self-esteem that I had left. Now, I'm not saying that I had a good self-esteem. I didn't. But that washed away the rest of my self-esteem. And I wasn't able to build it back up because I didn't know how. And I didn't realize that all these outside dependencies were destroying me. How did you feel about yourself? I mean, clearly you felt, you know, like you'd had enough of life. But what was your feeling towards you at that time? Shame. I felt like I had the scarlet letter of cancer. I was young. I was 41 years old. None of my friends had ever had it. And, 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 you know, when I was young and my parents talked about cancer, they would say, oh, so-and-so has cancer. It was like a whisper, right? It was like a shameful thing. And so I was like, oh my gosh, now I have nothing and I'm ashamed of myself. And I didn't cause the cancer. Of course. I mean, we didn't, we don't give ourselves cancer, but, and how would I ever why would I ever feel shame because I got cancer? Because I had no self-esteem. So tell me, Christine, you know, you, you went underwent multiple surgeries. You were still dealing with your chronic problems with your arm. Um, you had chemo for a year, I believe. 15 months. Right. H- how did you cope with that ongoing crisis? Because- Clearly, any emotion is not a permanent state, apart from possibly love for those that matter to us. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, how did you work through that, given that you were physically probably wiped out and all the physical signs, of course, that come with this type of um, dreadful cancer? How did, Tell me about, you know, those 15 months, how you managed that, that ongoing crisis and the turning points in that time for you. So I was about three weeks into the cancer diagnosis when I realized I had a mountain of women showing up for me every single day. And I didn't really shift at that moment, but I started to believe in myself because I saw all these other people believing me. And I feel like that's a courage net. So we can run out of courage. We can run out of bravery. But when people start showing up for us and they become the hands and feet, they carry us, they give up their time, they give up their resources to carry us and our family, then we rebuild our self-esteem, then we rebuild our courage. 
And so because I had those allies in my life and I didn't feel so alone, and even though they didn't understand what I was going through, right? I mean, I didn't know anybody that had a fused arm. I didn't know anybody that had breast cancer. And so it didn't matter to them, though. They were, they were rooting for me. They were cheering me on. And so when they started to show up for me over and over again, I started to show up for myself. And that, I think that was the first shift. And, and then I found a doctor, my oncologist, who I trusted. And he was very, he became very personal to me because I didn't trust any doctors when I was diagnosed with cancer. So how do you get through that? By the way. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, how do you go through 28 rounds of chemotherapy for 15 months when you don't trust the medical field? So he, he was really, he was vital to me trusting the medical field again. And so I had friends that rebuilt my trust in people. I had my medical team rebuild my trust in the medical world. And I started to get some ground. I started to level off my self-esteem. And so, and then I started to change what I was listening to. I started to change in my head, the thoughts. I started to stop saying, you're not worthy. Now that you're beauty is gone. You're not worth anything. I used to say that to myself. And then I was started to say, you are worthy. You matter. This stuff doesn't matter, but you matter. And we're going to figure it out. That is, um, you know, a, a big leap to make, right? Because we talk a lot about self-talk and how we talk to ourselves and how the language in our heads how did you go about that? How did you make that a habit, given particularly what you were going through physically as well with the exhaustion and the treatments and the consequences of those treatments? Yeah, so I had, I was lucky enough to be able to have help with my children and I was too sick to take care of them and myself. And so I had this pause almost in life where I had 15 months of a lot of quiet time. Of course, I was a lot of the time I was in the bathtub or I was violently ill on my bathroom floor. It wasn't pleasant, quiet time, but I had an opportunity to stop and pause and say, okay, who are you? But I, I chose that, right? I chose that time to do introspection. I chose that time to work. I chose that time to listen to my thoughts. And I also chose that time to figure out how did I allow a man to bully me for that long? Like, where did that come from? And so I was asking myself all these questions. What makes you tick? What makes you stay up at night? And, and once I started asking myself those questions, I started to hear all those terrible negative thoughts. And then I was able to take those thoughts captive. I was able to stop them and replace them. But if we don't literally take a pause and say, okay, I need to listen to my inner voice, then we're never going to hear it right? We're never going to hear those negative thoughts. It has to be so mind. You have to be very clear. You have to be very mindful of doing it. It's work. And I don't want to make it light. Like it's easy. It's not. It's taken me many, many, many years to get rid of my old self who, by the way, was not a bad person, but I was not kind to myself. And, and so that's a long process. It was a long process for me, but it's also a choice. Also, you know, it makes me think of the fact that how we handle a crisis can define us um, and also impact others. You know, you're a mother, you're a wife, you're a daughter, you're a friend, right? It, these are not situations where we, uh, you know, it only, it's only about us, irrespective of how other people right. behave. Um, what did you learn about yourself despite all of these you know, unspeakable hardships as you started to come through slowly? I learned so much, <laughs> which is why I think my story has been, been so popular because I'm, I'm vulnerable enough to share it. Like I got rid of the pride and the ego. I just said goodbye to the self-preservation of like putting out this fake facade to society, which I did for 41 years. And when all that was washed away, I said to myself, this story has to have purpose. You can't go through all this pain without having purpose. And so I made, I made a note to myself that I was going to use this to help other people. And the other thing I realized is that people were watching me, my family, my friends, the community, and I could model for them anything I wanted. I could model fear, which by the way, was justified. 
But living in that fear was not justified because for me, that's, that's not justified to, to hurt myself and fear living in fear is hurting yourself. And so what I decided to model was courage. And what I decided to do was not meditate or ruminate so much on the outcome, meaning I didn't know whether I was going to live or die. I didn't know if I was going to sur- survive cancer, but the more, the more I let go of the outcome, the better I was able to live each day. Right. And did you find, like now that you can look back and we're all wise looking back, but when you look back today, were there moments or was there a pivotal moment when things started to shift, all this work that you were doing on yourself, all this exploration through pain and suffering? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that moment or those moments. Yeah. So I started to make choices differently. And I, you know, when I was lonely or I felt bad about myself, I would go shopping or I'd go meet a friend for lunch, or I'd try to fill myself up by getting a better modeling job or contacting my agency, my modeling agency and going, okay, I want to work, right? That's going to make me feel better. Fill me up world, you know? And, and I, when I was sitting there going through chemo, all plugged up to a port and this massive drugs going inside me, I was like, that stuff doesn't work. That materialism, that dependency on the world doesn't work. So what will work? You know, I started to ask myself, what will work? And so I started to make different choices. I started to listen to different music. I started to listen to different podcasts. I turned off the news. I started to, again, I changed the shift in my own, the play in my own head. I started to listen to different people and I, and I left certain relationships because those people weren't cheering me on. Those people were taking me back into the place that I didn't want to go. And so by choosing differently, I, I started to live a different life and I started to have hope and I started to build my foundation and my self-esteem on my faith and my faith in God and my, my faith in myself. And, and so all those false idols they got washed away and I didn't replace them with different false idols. How did that feel when you, and and again, it's not a permanent feeling, but as you started to go down a different road, how did you feel and how did you feel about yourself? Well, it was really scary because I felt like the people that were in my life were in my life because of that old version of myself. And what if they all rejected me, right? Because the new version was so different and I didn't want to go back to the old version. And so although it was scary, I knew I couldn't sustain the person that I used to be. And I knew that I wanted to serve. I knew why I wanted to be a leader. I knew I wanted to inspire people. And some people rejected me in my life. Um, and so it was, was scary. But, I was, but, but going back to that despair, going back to that insecurity, it wasn't an option anymore for me. And, and I got to a place in my life where I didn't care what other people thought of me. Because when you're faced with life and death, listen, I had an oncologist say to me, this is your percentile chance of survival. When somebody says that to you, your life looks really short. And I thought to, my, I thought to myself, okay, I have a shorter, I maybe have a shorter life, right? How am I going to use that? Because at the end of the day, if I don't use it to help other people, I'm not going to feel very good about myself at the short end of this life. And so every day that I live now, I live to serve. And and if I get cancer back tomorrow and I don't survive, I'm good because I've done everything I possibly can to help this world, help other people. And I, and I love myself now that self love carries me. So Christine, you've talked about, um, replacing fear with courage and, um, you know, handling fear with your faith. Tell me a little bit about that. I, I believe in God. I believe, um, that I'll give you, I'll give you an example. People can understand through stories. One day I came back from chemotherapy and my mother was on one side of me and my father was on the other side of me and they're carrying, kind of carrying me into my house because I was so violently ill. And I got home and I, my father opened the front door and I looked in my house and all over were these sticky notes, these yellow sticky notes. And on every sticky note was a scripture. My friends had come over while I was at chemo and papered my house in scriptures so that, oh, 
so that now what I was looking at was God's words, was Bible verses instead of my pretty porcelain and my beautiful china and my Prada bag. I wasn't looking at those things. I was looking at these scriptures and that was teaching me. And then I replaced my podcast with, with preachers. And then I replaced my music with, with Christian music. Now that's how I got through it. And I needed hope. And the only hope that I felt was from faith. And so my dependence on God, that was secure for me. That was, that was solid ground for me because the other stuff can be washed away so easily. It can be taken from you. It's temporal. You know, faith is eternal. And that's how, that's a difference for me. Totally. And when you came through all of that, you know, what point did you feel ready to throw yourself more fully into this life of service? Because I, I would add before, you know, you answer that one that today you really do devote your life to helping and supporting others. And that takes uh, through a number of platforms, you know, as a writer, as a motivational speaker, as a mentor, uh, as a humanitarian in many different ways. Um, you're on the board of a number of charities. I, I love the charity eBeauty that you are Thank you. Um, playing a major role in, which for those that don't know, is a, a national wig program, exchange program, because obviously wigs are very expensive. Um, so for yes. those who can't afford wigs during treatment, um, you also collaborated with a, a bathing suit brand uh, to yes. manufacture a line of swimming for women who no longer have their breasts due to cancer. Um, take me to that time when you felt ready to go forward on this new road. Well, I knew when I was going through chemotherapy that I had a purpose in this world. And before my purpose was, it was wonderful to be a mother and to be a model. And that was fine, but it wasn't enough for me. I needed a, I had a bigger purpose now. I had a story that needed to be told. That's how I felt about it. And it wasn't self-serving. It wasn't like, oh, I need my story to be out there to make me feel better. Or, oh, I need my story to be out there so that my name is out there. It was because I was able to rebuild my life on faith. I was able to re rebuild my life on women showing up for each other. People needed to hear that because it gave hope to the world. And so how, how was I going to do that? I always run to write a book. So I wrote the book. And once I had the book, it gave me a platform to become a speaker. And listen, I was in front of a camera for 30 years. So I was comfortable speaking in front of people. And I often say, oh, God was just preparing me by being a model to be a motivational speaker. You have a bigger impact. And in all the traumas that I went through, I didn't let that stop me. I let it fuel me. And so recently, I last summer, I had an infection in my left breast cavity. I had implants after my mastectomies. And I loved my implants. I actually thought that was kind of a prize after breast cancer. It's not that I wanted implants ever. I never got them. But I, I didn't want to be flat or concave. I wanted to, I wanted to have implants. And so I, they got infected about a year ago. And ultimately, after months of an infection, they were excavated. And so I had more surgery. I had two major surgeries with that. And that left me concave. And for a while, that stung because I didn't. I, I wasn't used to that space. I was used to looking to, into a mirror after breast cancer with fake breasts. And so that was very new to me. And after a couple months of feeling bad, not bad about myself, I didn't have a pity party, but I was like, why another trauma? Why more pain? And the physical pain of that, the MRSA infection and the surgeries was really grotesque. It, the pain was horrible. What was and, your and, answer and, to the why? Because it's such a human question to ask, you know, why again, why so much more? Why such pain? Well, here's the answer. I was now in a space that was untouched in the, in the world of bathing suits. Like right? there's no bathing suits for people with concave chest. There's, and, and people, you know, I live in Miami, I wear bathing suits. And every time I would go buy a bathing suit, it, even if it had a, had a padding, it would invert when you went in the ocean. So there was no choices. And so after a couple months of like, okay, why did this happen? And going through my closet and throwing out half of my wardrobe that could no longer fit me, I, I went one day into my medicine cabinet and I took out an ACE bandage and I started to play with it on my chest. 
because I wanted to figure out how to find, figure out a, a bathing suit I could wear and other people could wear. And I, listen, I have a huge social media presence. And so I'm the one that gets the messages from people who are saying, Hey, we don't have any access to bathing suits. Hey, we don't have, there's nothing that we can, right? And so, and, and I also got messages from them saying, how do you parade walking around with really tight clothing in a concave chest? Like you're giving us a voice. You're giving us uh, courage because they weren't doing it. They were afraid to, they were putting, they were wearing prosthetics, which by the way are great. The prosthetics that they make these, these days are amazing. If that's what you want, it's out there. I didn't want to do that. This is the body I have. It's not the one I chose, but I'm going to be comfortable in this body. And my self-esteem is built on faith. It's not built on this world anymore. And so I decided after a couple of months of not feeling very good and obviously in physical pain, I took this ace bandage and I made a prototype of a bathing suit. And I called a company, a, a couture bathing suit line. And I said, I have this idea. There's a whole group of women that need our help. Let's make a prototype. Let's make a bathing suit for this group of people. And the woman met with me and she said, I'd love to do it. So now we're in production to do that. And so if I had just cowered in my pain and if I had not share, show, shown courage and for myself, if I had not shown up for myself and said, no, this, these people need help, these people need hope, then I wouldn't have this bathing suit line and we wouldn't have options for this demographic, right? But I used the pain instead of shove, shove, you know, shoving the pain down, I used it not only to help myself, but to have help other people. And so if that's your mindset, and when you say to yourself, okay, why me? I replace it with, with, okay, God knows I have the courage to do something with it. So that's why. Well, I love that story. And by the way, you are um, a great entrepreneur because that's what all great entrepreneurs do. They, saw, they, they come up with something to solve a problem, right? Exactly. And you know, exactly. as I say, most people can be entrepreneurs, but most of the time it just stays an idea in people's head and they get so fearful that they can't do it, that they don't, right? Exactly. It's sort of yeah. self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. Christina, you know, I would love to talk to you about, you know, <laughs> women accepting themselves, um, embracing themselves, owning who they are. You are um, a senior ambassador for Look, Learn, Locate, which resonates with this theme. Tell me a little bit about that and about your work there. So Learn, Look, Locate is, um, it's, a, it's an access, it's a website, it's a resource for people with breast cancer. It's specific to breast cancer. And so it talks about new studies with different treatments. It talks about, it has a lot of women that are featured who've been through breast cancer, who survived it. There's people with metastatic breast cancer and it's storytelling. And, and so I'm a part of it because I believe in what they're doing. There's Susan B. Coleman, which is a huge breast cancer organization in the United States, maybe in the world, I'm not sure. This is, this is a new, this is, it's not a, I guess it's a brand. It's a new brand where they're saying, okay, let's share the information. Let's be, you know what I mean? Instead of like trying to get the information from this, this website or this website, let's just centralize it. Let's centralize it. And so that's why I love it. Listen, I have a lot of, people call me a lot of things. Like right now I'm called a cancer disruptor. That's maybe my famous, my favorite title. I like that because, one. yeah, because I don't want, you know, like I'm talking about implants. I'm talking about how, you know, they can cause infections, how they're not always healthy. And, and by being a cancer disruptor, I have a voice, right? Who doesn't want a voice? We all want a voice. We all have a voice, but we have to have the courage to use it. I couldn't agree more. And I think, I'd love to hear a little bit from you on, you know, since you were 11, you were modeling for a lot of the big names. Today, not just the couture houses, but a lot of mainstream high street brands are being much more inclusive. You know, yes. diversity and inclusion is the narrative uh, in terms of shape and size and height and color and, and the whole range yes. and everything in between. Do you think this world of, you know, women and how we feel about ourselves has really moved on since you starting, not just in the modeling world, but, but just in general today. Are things different? Have things moved along? Because women seem to struggle with the same themes a lot, don't they? 
Absolutely. I think we're making great strides. Obviously, we have a lot to go. I listen, I like I said, I get thousands of messages from women who say to me, keep going, we need you to show us how to do this. And so I think my greatest asset to the world is to teach people about self esteem. Because I don't think we realize how, how important that is. We base our decisions every single day on how we feel about ourselves. And if we don't feel good about ourselves, we make decisions that don't fulfill what we want to do in life. And I lived it. And so I'm able to talk about it. So if I can show up with courage and I can show up and say, listen, I am so scarred. I'm, I'm dis- disabled in my right arm. I have scars all over my chest. I have scars all over my abdomen. My beauty does not give me my worth. If I can show up and say that in the modeling world, like I'm walking in New York Fashion Week. It's maybe, it's one of the most prestigious modeling things to do. I'm 51 years old. I'm scarred everywhere. And they're, and one of the designers is making a, a one-of-a-kind dress for me to walk in. Why? Because we're trying to be an inclusive world and show that every every everything doesn't fit one, right? We're not trying to put people into these boxes or these labels anymore. There's beauty in ashes. There's beauty in scars. And this is who we are. Let's just accept who we are. And I think that's critical. The only reason I'm walking in New York Fashion Week is because of this inclusivity. So we are doing a good job. Well, that is so reaffirming, I have to say. And I think that we spend the early part of our life conforming trying to do what we're told, uh, being how other people want us to be. And actually, as I always say, we are physically different, you know, from a biological yes. perspective. And we all have our voice if we can just uncover it. Christine, you talk um, on occasion about focusing more on oneself and everybody in life, whether they're a mother or not, in a relationship or not, gets dragged into all sorts of things. Yes. How do you do that? on a practical level? Like what are, what are your tips for people about just focusing on yourself for the right reasons? Well, do as I say, not as I do, because I don't have a lot of balance in my life because I'm on such a mission to help people. I, I, I say women, but it's really people. Um, and so I don't take a lot of time. I don't do small talk and I don't have a personal life right now. And I'd rather work. I'd rather make a difference in as many people's lives right now. So like I said, do as I say, not as I do, because I don't think that's healthy. Um, but what I do think that I do every single day is remind myself of my value. I pour into faith-based music every day. I don't turn on the news. I don't look for fear-based anything in this world. I don't look for people that are critical. I look for people that give me hope. I don't seek out things that make me feel bad, meaning I don't, I try to eat healthy to make me feel better. I don't watch violent things because that, you know, causes anxiety. I I do take thoughts captive. I don't, I do trip myself up sometimes and say negative talk, but I stop myself and I change the narrative. It's not, it doesn't automatically go away. Even years of practice, you still have to nurture that. It's like a muscle. You know, we go to school, we go to school to work on our brains. We go to the gym to exercise, to work on our bodies. I take time every day to work on my self-esteem. That's so interesting. Tell me, Christine, you know, you get, a, you have a huge following. You have women and men seeking your advice and your opinion on many things. Given um, the year and a half that's been with COVID and a lot of people having struggled and perhaps not anticipated the struggle they've gone through emotionally or perhaps physically during this time. And, you know, other people who've struggled with illness more generally in their lives or loss. What advice do you give people when they have those moments of, you know, pure struggle where they feel low, where they feel hopeless? So hopelessness and helplessness are both taught. Meaning we can meditate on helplessness just as easily as we can meditate on hopefulness. And it's a choice. And our reaction to trauma is in our control. Also meditating on the outcome is a bad idea. (laughs) And so like for me, meditating on, am I going to get cancer back? Which by the way, a lot of people do. That doesn't, that's fear-based. That doesn't, that doesn't allow me to live today. 
And so if we say to ourselves, well, this COVID is never going to end, that's an absolute and it's not true. But we have to remind self-talk is critical. We have to, and, and by the way, loneliness, which is all around us right now, that's one of the toughest feelings to feel. But if we feel, if we feel lonely, you have to look to say, look, look to see where you seek companionship. And if it's with people, if it's with this world, which we all need, um, that's a base. But if it's not, if it doesn't go further than that, like for me, when I'm very lonely and I've felt very lonely in times of my life, I seek the Lord. And when I do that, I feel less lonely. I know that he's with me. I don't know how to do it without that. And so I've done it without that in stages of my life. And I've gotten to places where I felt so lonely that I wanted to quit my life. I understand. And tell me what, um, you know, you, you've been through a lot of change, much of it, not by choice, but you have grown through that change. You've made decisions about how you, who you want to be and how you want to live um, for yourself and for the world, because you're on a big mission. Um, I'm on a big mission. You really are. And you're, 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 you're unstoppable and you're not going to be stopped. That's absolutely evident. How would you advise other people who really want to find their purpose? That's a, such a good question. I don't think anybody's asked me that. I, I was searching for so long, but I was searching in the wrong direction. I was searching from outside sources. When I started to search from within, I realized my purpose. So it's an inside job. You have to find it from within. And some of the questions that you can ask yourself are, what keeps you up at night, right? I mean, if you turn on the news, what's the most, what, like for me, it's children with cancer. That keeps me up more than anything. And so if you find out those, right? I mean, if you find out those things by asking yourself questions and putting yourselves in positions to figure that out, then you, then you figure out your purpose because then you're going to be led in that direction. And so that's how I found my purpose. I also said to myself, of all the pain that I've gone through, how can I use this in what way? And I realized that I can use it every day in every way. Meaning like when I walk out in the morning to go for a walk, I'm still serving. I'm looking around. I'm smiling at people. I'm engaging with people in a time where people don't do that. And so I know I'm affecting lives the minute I wake up and then I go, you know, more, I go down the road of like now with my job, with who I serve, with my social media, like you said, with how I, my motivational speaking, with my book, with my writing. And it just become, it can become your life, but you have to search it and it comes from within. And you are a guide and a shining star in the life of many who has been a guide for you in on, on planet Earth? And what's the best piece of advice they or someone else has given you? Well, I had a lot of women. Um, I had a really good network of women that became my courage net. And when they showed up for me day after day, and they gave up their time, their resources, their own families to help with mine, they basically said to me, you're our Bible study for this 15 months. And they taught me how to serve. They taught me how to lead. They taught me how to show up. And when they, when, when I was done with treatment, I said, okay, what's well, now my time to do what they did for me for everybody else. And, 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 and I also got to a point in my life where I was like, I had gone from thinking my voice doesn't matter at all. Who would ever listen to me to thinking my voice matters and people are going to listen to me because I'm going to shout from the rooftops that you matter. I'm going to shout from the rooftops that women standing together is maybe more powerful than anything. And now that makes me unstoppable because I'm not going to quit that. And it's true. Those things are facts. I absolutely love that. So Christine, one final question from me. What are the big exciting um, things ahead of you this coming year? Like or, well, yeah, the, the New York Fashion Week. What else is um, in the pipeline for you uh, that you can share with us that is really taking you further down this life of bringing change to others and being a change agent yourself? 
Yeah. So I'm doing more collaborations with brands who have the same vision that I do, which is great. So the bigger the platform, the bigger the voice, right? And again, it's not about, it's not about my name. It's not about Christine Handy, but it's about the message. And so the bigger audience I have, the better I feel about getting that out there. Also, my book is becoming a film and hopefully that'll be starting to, to shoot soon. It was uh, meant to shoot in May of 2020. So it was postponed. Any secrets about who's playing you or is that under wraps? Um, that's under wraps and I can't, I can't share that information, but I'm excited. You know, me too. And the, the film is mirrors my book, which doesn't always happen. A lot of times there's adaptations from books to film and they resemble each other, but the film version, the screenplay version of my book much, very much mirrors my actual book and my story. It's a fictional depiction of my life. And so I'm very excited about that. Again, not because I want my name in bright light. The story is important because it shows how women can save each other, can save lives just by showing up for each other. Well, that is super exciting. I'm um, Thank you. very much looking forward to seeing it in due course. And um, Christine Handy, thank you so much for being with me today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Double Espresso with D, with me, D Sterling. If you enjoyed it, I'd love you to review and subscribe to the podcast so we can share these amazing stories with others. I'd also love to connect with you, so feel free to contact me via Instagram DM at D Double Espresso. Until the next time, au revoir.